So Julia Partemüller um, is a senior scientist at the Department of Government at the University of Vienna and member of the Vienna Center for Electoral Studies. Uh, she's part of the project team of the Austrian National Election Study and the Austrian Corona Panel Project. Uh, so this is where we start the, the presentation. So in her presentation, she will focus on the perspective of data producers pursuing an open science agenda and who wish to share their data rapidly. Julia, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Marika, for the introduction, and also thanks Alt for the uh, introduction of the of the SESTA catalog. I'm sort of presenting one data set that you can find through the uh, SESTA catalog, which is uh, the data produced by the Austrian Corona uh, Panel Project, which we are making available uh, very quick. It is a study monitoring the impact of COVID-19 in Austria and we, uh, data collection is currently still ongoing and I will say a few more things when I go through uh, the slides um, uh, to let you know what we have here. Um, so Marika, how does it work? Can I click it? You are clicking, okay. Um, yeah, you just give me the cue and then and I'll move it forward. So we, Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I, I will say when we have to move to the next slide. So I will give you a quick overview about the background of the project, how it came about, uh, the study design, a few words on data quality. I will also want to say a few things about data access and the workflow, which I think um, COVID-19 has changed dramatically uh, compared to how we have been doing things previously. And then I also have compiled a selection of findings, um, which maybe are topics you might be interested in. Um, the, the survey has covered so many themes by now. I think essentially whatever you would want to look at, we would have some question about it, um, but I will just showcase a few findings here. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, yeah, so um, the Austrian Corona Panel Project came about uh, in 2020 when the Corona pandemic uh, struck and the goal was to capture the economic, psychological, social and political impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the Austrian uh, population. Uh, we initially got funded through uh, yeah, rep response scheme set up by the government um, for for research to be done, and we got some seed money from the University of Vienna. And essentially, within one week, uh, we kicked off this uh, project. Um, and later down the line, we gathered further funding. Currently, we are funded through the Austrian Science Fund, and we still uh, will be collecting. Uh, data for about the ne next six months, and we have been collecting data over the last one and a half years. Um, yeah, here you also see the names from the project team, so it's not just me, it's also many of my colleagues here at the University of Vienna uh, have been uh, working on that project. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, so um, the Austrian Corona Panel Project is designed as a, as a multi-wave online panel survey, uh, with about 1,500 respondents per wave of the Austrian resident population aged older than 14. Um, the, uh, it's an online survey recruited from the online from an online access panel uh, from a commercial provider. Uh, the initial response rate was particularly high for those kind of surveys. So we had a response rate of 35.2, uh, which, if which, for example, for comparison in the election study where we were working with the same firm, we had a response rate of nine percent. Yeah. So during that time, apparently, people were also quite eager answering surveys. So far, 24 waves are available i should say i'm a so otto is here as well i'm a bit i'm a bit the bottleneck of making those data sets available currently uh wave 25 is in the field uh today and will like the data set will arrive tomorrow so from tomorrow on we will have 25 waves available and as i said there will be about uh six more waves going until march or april or even beyond that depending on how long this crisis will linger on in the first 10 weeks, we conducted weekly surveys and later we spaced out the waves uh, to monthly surveys. And that is what uh, we are currently uh, still continuing that work. The a, a data paper, so I think I'll also mention data papers uh, with methodological details has appeared in European political science and uh, describes features of the data set. Um, next slide. 
so these are also things from from the data paper uh so you see how how key demographics match with the official statistics uh the data set comes uh shipped with weights uh to correct for the uh, sort of divergence but actually the overall we have a very good data quality i think in terms of representativeness there's a little bit of a problem with uh, migrants and minorities in the sense that we don't reach these people so well uh, especially as our survey is only conducted in german so that is a bit of a shortcoming maybe uh, but otherwise i think we match quite well uh, all the targets um, next slide and also in terms of panel retention i must say these people like have been answering the survey have been incredible loyal this is just the statistics for the first uh 10 waves i believe but uh also until now i think we have about i think like around 350 people who really took part in every single survey it's hard to believe but uh, anyway, of course, we do refreshments once in a while, and uh, we also did some assessment of the of the patterns of panel attrition. In general, one could say, and that's actually quite similar to what we find in the election study as well, is that young people and uh, in particular young male people are a, a little bit less reliant in answering and they drop in and out. Uh, but otherwise, um, uh, the patterns are, let's say, less systematic um next slide uh yes yeah, so and the curated versions of the data sets are made available via ouster we have a scientific use uh version and the open access edition uh i don't know um so for you i guess you're mostly researchers i guess the scientific use version is maybe more interesting as it captures more details and um demographics of, of the respondents so i think probably that data set could be of interest to some among you currently we have released three different versions of the data set as i said i'm currently working on the fourth release which is i'm um, a little bit of the uh bottleneck here but that will be available also very very soon and i guess um the future uh data will then made will be made available as fast as possible um yes so uh please next slide um yeah just a few words about the workflow so because um so usually in the past i think we used to do data collection then we <laughs> did data curation we released the data set we do our research and we would have public impact but now everything has changed in the sense that everything is happening simultaneously so so as i said we are currently so i'm currently doing data curation on the one hand i'm also doing data collection on the other hand we're already preparing the next questionnaire uh we are writing the uh, research articles and we are writing blogs uh, for the public impact and also doing a lot of interviews and, and media and everything at the same time because uh sort of there's such a high interest in in this in this data that we get really uh, so much questions also by the public and are constantly busy with gathering new data on new topics um now, for example, here in Austria, a new anti-vax party has emerged and such. You know, it's constantly uh, this workflow, which has made things extremely intense in a way. And um, but then on the other hand, uh, I think it has also uh, I think we have also sort of lived up to the challenge and, and shown that we are sort of able to uh, juggle all around all these things simultaneously. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, so then I just wanted to show you a few findings. I realize I'm already a bit short on time, so we'll maybe need to speed up a little bit with this. But just to give you a bit of the ideas of what kind of themes we have here. So we have questions on health, behavior, and attitudes. Um, so you, can, you could research questions like, uh, why do people comply with uh, COVID measures? Or also, uh, what has been a, a big topic here in Austria lately, is why are people hesitant to get vaccinated? and uh, possibly what could be done about it um another a part or another aspect a sort of questions has um has been on the economic and social impact especially on how the crisis has affected on equally different groups in society and uh here i will show you a few results on on young people who have been sort of affected disproportionately in some ways um and then also as my background for example is also in political science we also of course have also a lot of political questions uh, which have mattered a great deal as sort of COVID politics has become high politics in a way um and um what we have been seeing is well there was a lot of you know solidarity during the first um 
lockdown. Since then, uh, the situation has become extremely polarized and now especially around vaccines, uh, we have a very highly polarized uh, situation here. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, so these are some results from uh, compliance measures, uh, just from a paper from Bernhard Kittel, uh, together with my colleagues, uh, Fabian Karleitner and David Schiestel. And they found essentially, like, <laughs> why do people comply? Is either you're scared of the virus, or you trust the government that they might do something useful, or you feel like some sort of social norm that you should comply as everyone else is complying. And, and I think that is what, what they have shown here. Um, the trust in institutions, but also social norms, play a very important role in sort of containing the virus through uh, these non-medical uh, measures uh, to, to contain the virus. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, research from a paper that has appeared in Journal of uh, in Frontiers of Public Health by myself, uh, together with Katrin Paul and uh, uh, Jakob Moritz Ebal, uh, where we looked into vaccine hesitancy, which is something we already asked about last May. Of course, now we are asking even more questions related to that. And what we found already last May when the vaccines was, weren't here even there, um, were some quite a noticeable uh, patterns again uh, risk perceptions of course playing a, a important role also age but then also we find sort of this yeah again this sense of community sort of this social norm aspect to it as well as the political impact with certain parties here in austria as well as people who are being actually quite alienated from politics in general being very hesitant uh, uh with regards to vaccines and and this is got a got, uh, sort of the situation also where we are now because everyone who has trust and who feels sort of connected has been uh, vaccinated now and now what remains are people who are very skeptical uh and don't feel a lot of trust in the government and such so um yeah it was already foreseeable and you could have done something about it if you had listened to us uh but uh, anyway that's where we are now and we'll see how we get out of this crisis um next slide Ah, yes, so this is about the unequal impact on young and older generations and um, also this question of whether, will, whether this new generation will suffer more um, because, you know, young people still you know, need to enter the job market and we know from other crises that they have suffered disproportionately and to some extent this seems to be, hap seems to be the case um, also in, uh, with the COVID crisis. Uh, this is from one of our, uh, uh, from two different blog posts and from our Corona blog where we uh, release new analysis all the time. And um, loss of income has been disproportionately about younger people. And also the psychological impact, like feelings of loneliness, have been disproportionately among the young. So both sort of in terms of objective measures, but also psychological measures, we feel that young people have been sort of um, quite strongly affected by this uh, crisis. Um, next slide. However, what, what can be said is that young people have some sort of, and I, I think that is maybe where I would say, uh, you know, maybe there's also a, a silver lining here. Young people have this enormous hope that it will get better, right? So in terms of optimism, despite being, you know, affected worse in, in some way, young people at the same time are the most optimistic about their own future and the future of the country. And so, you might say, uh, as bad as everything is, they they still don't don't feel it really, which might maybe explain why they are not protesting that much actually, but maybe they they should be. I'm not really taking a stance here, but maybe just to give you an idea. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, and so this is about the rally effect, uh, which we did together study with colleagues from France, uh, who also gathered some very similar data like we did. And uh, we compared Austria and uh, France trust in government during this first wave of the pandemic. And uh, so this paper has recently appeared in West European politics. And uh, so what we found is that that in Austria, we had a very strong rally effect. Uh, where people trusted the government highly, but unfortunately that went away quite fast. And ever since then, things have become more complicated. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, so here you see again, sort of that in Austria, we really had this closure between the opposition and the government really working together at the peak of the crisis. Whereas in France, you had this quite polarized situation already early on. 
Um, now I would say we have a strong polarization here, but this was still from the first wave. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and so this is about um, yeah, growing polarization. So this is about whether the measures are too strong or too weak. And you can see that very, very much early in the in the pandemic, everyone was saying the measures are appropriate. Yeah? So uh, although some people don't seem to remember that, but most people really thought, okay, uh, it's a dangerous virus, we need to do something and, and the actions were appropriate. But then uh, moving into the second lockdown and the last data point here is January, you see this pattern has become extremely polarized especially those people thinking that all measures, despite the measures being, of course, much lighter now, um, being too extreme. And, and this has remained like that and sort of also spiraled into the distrust to the vaccine because people just, you know, just don't want to do anything anymore uh, to work for this crisis or having their life affected by it. Um, okay, so next slide. I think that might my concluding remarks. Yes, so, um, so, I think my conclusion from all this is that COVID-19 has um, not only transformed our daily life um, as we know it, but also accelerated and opened up uh, academic uh, research, made it more interdisciplinary uh, with many you know, uh, researchers from various fields working together to solve practical uh, problems. And uh, yeah, our project has gathered uh, panel data in that context, like very in-depth uh, panel data, um, which give a lot of yeah, in, uh, insights into individual dynamics in health behavior, but also economic, psychological, social and political consequences of the crisis. And I think what is, is really a, a novelty is how fast we're making this uh, data available and um, uh, to everyone who, who wants to contribute on and help with analyzing those data. And um, uh, yeah, so I think that uh, our data has been really instrumental in, in demonstrating what's, what has been happening, uh, how, uh, you know, uh, why people are helping with the crisis or now they don't anymore. And I think, yeah, so so we get really good insights on yeah what the situation is and can give a lot of uh, advice on, on what has been going on. And I think that has been a quite unique experience. Um, uh, at least for me so far, because I, I will say previously we were maybe a little bit more in the ivory tower and of things and, and now we are yeah out in the public with everything we do uh, sort of on a day to day basis. Thanks anyway, so that that was it. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for clicking me through the slides. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Julia. It was really interesting to see the wealth of information that you've collected, the wealth of data that can be reused. Uh, and I'm sure that also Otto later on in the in the second part of the, the session, we'll talk about how they were uh, the process that you collaborated on and making them available. But it was really interesting also to see the conclusions that you could already um, the, uh, extract from the research that you've done with these data. <clears throat> so thank you very much. Um, then we move to the to uh, the presentation, the references, and so thanks.